Hello, and welcome to a Space Foundation Emerging Trends interview. I'm Shelley Brunswick, Chief Operating Officer at Space Foundation. Today, we have an exciting discussion about the emerging trends in India. This international interdisciplinary panel of experts will share their journeys and observations about the trends taking place in the region. Let me introduce our amazing panelists. Arpit Chattavedi is the co-founder and chief executive officer of Global Policy Insights, a centralist think tank focused on governance, international political economy, international security studies, and sustainability, based out of New Delhi, New York, and London. He is also the co-founder of EnviroPol, an environmental consulting firm based out of New Delhi. He is the co-director of the Global Policy, Diplomacy, and Sustainability Fellowship and serves as a co-chair on various international affairs forums, such as Quad Security Forum. Welcome, Arpit. Thank you so much, Shelly, and uh, really excited and looking forward to be discussing this uh, really, really important issue that uh, has the future of our uh, nations and our mankind uh, in its store and at stake. So thank you so much for inviting me. Thank you for joining us. Our next guest is Rushanka Amnutkar. She is a space exploration scientist working on satellite remote sensing applications for planetary observations. She is on the board of advisors at the Kalpana Chawla Project for Innovation, Entrepreneurism, and Space Studies at the International Space University located in France, and research advisor of the Space Applications Division at TODER, Together for Sustainable Space Studies, to help students working on space applications internationally. Well, welcome, Rushanka. I'm very fortunate to be a part of this amazing discussion. Looking forward to it. Well, thank you so much for joining us. And rounding out our amazing panelists today is Dana Lynette. She is the president and CEO of the Summit Group DC, a uniquely capable strategic consulting firm that empowers private companies and US government clients to meet mission objectives, access opportunities, grow operations, and take decisive actions to position for the future. Summit Group DC also provides unique insights and education on the aerospace and defense sector to the institutional investor community. She is a former career diplomat with the U.S. Department of State. Dana is a long-recognized international and national security expert and public speaker with over 25 years of experience in and out of U.S. government. She has also taken over as the head of public sector at Lilt, Inc., a Silicon Valley tech company serving the U.K., U.S. and Australian governments with specialized language AI and machine learning translation software, powering the national security mission. Well, welcome, Dana. It's a pleasure to have you joining us today. Thank you, Shelley. It's great to be with you and Roshanka and Arpit. Happy to be back and supporting the Space Foundation. Awesome. Well, we have an exciting list of topics to cover today. So what I'd first like to do is give each of you an opportunity to talk about some of the emerging trends you're seeing in India. So Arpit, would you provide us your insight on those emerging trends that you're seeing in India? Certainly, Shelley. Uh, first, let's start by uh, understanding, you know, putting the Indian uh, space exploration and the space industry's growth in context. So if you look at India, just like many other countries, the uh, whole space agenda caught attention uh, first from the government and then it seeped into the private sector. Now, in India, uh, it is one of those countries where right from the first prime minister of this country, Prime Minister Jawaharlal Nehru, until uh, Prime Minister Narendra Modi uh, right now. So right from the first prime minister of the country, each of them has been involved in space exploration missions, uh, setting up space agencies and focusing on uh, putting a high premium on space exploration and the growth of space industry for the Indian economy and for Indian security. So. The ISRO, the Indian Space Research Organization, uh, was set up in 1969 and, you know, uh, since then, and the, uh, this was still the time when uh, Prime Minister Jawaharlal Nehru was in office, and since then that has been the premier uh, space research organization in India. Now, if you ask me about the trends, uh, there are a number of trends both on the government as well as the private sector side. Uh, 
if you were to uh, categorize if there were various archetypes of how uh, space sectors have developed in different parts of the world in india uh, it is almost uh, developing in a three step model so uh, step one is uh, strengthening of the government infrastructure strengthening of the government as uh, a facilitator for the space industry in india and there you see not just uh, isro which is you know amongst the top six strongest departments for space exploration amongst all of the governments uh, across the world you have the government of india setting up uh, the antrix corporation which is uh, uh, you know in hindi we call it antriksh uh, which literally means the universe uh, and this corporation is a public sector entity uh, set up and managed by the government of india and the idea behind this is to uh, facilitate and to uh, really bring in and unleash the potential of the private sector uh, in space exploration when when you're talking about you know uh, upstream capabilities which is uh, you know about launches and uh, you know exploration missions and things like that that's what antriksh looks into it also seeks to develop downstream capabilities which is uh, you know uh, application of various space technologies such as uh, you know uh, gis or the gps and you know uh, various uh, you know agriculture related applications of the space industry so this is uh, you know uh, what antriksh has been doing uh, specifically and then uh, similarly the government has also set up an organization called in space which is more like the coordinating agency which coordinates the relationship between uh, the private sector uh you know the various uh, educational institutions such as the iits iims that's the indian institute of technology indian institute of management and uh, it's almost like you know uh, an ecosystem engineer in india so the idea over here is that uh, these two come together along with another organization called the new space india limited uh, that's nsil uh nsil is focusing on uh, the real hard infrastructure for marketing and supply side agency building in india these three come together and really lay the ground for lay the capacity uh, foundation for the private sector for space to thrive in, in india now the question emerges that uh, okay what's uh, what's india's role in the uh, you know uh, larger space economy so you have three government uh, you know organizations broadly uh, which are trying to give a fillip to the private sector in space for india now if you look at it globally if we are to look at it strategically uh, the global space economy is about 360 billion dollars and india has about 2% share in it with about 7 uh, billion uh, you know in the space economy now there has been a general agreement in india especially uh, you know a through a vision set up by prime minister modi that india is to become a 5 trillion dollar economy by 2024 or you know some people argue that by 2030 the idea is to shoot for the 5 trillion mark now if india is to become a 5 trillion dollar economy uh, if you look at most of the uh, you know uh, places where india needs to go more uh, grow most of the economic sectors where india needs to grow space sector stands out as a great contributor uh, that would fuel the growth of the indian economy so uh, you know space sector for indian economy to become a 5 trillion dollar worth uh, by 2030 space sector would need to be 50 billion dollar by 2024 according to many studies right now it's 7 billion dollars with a 2% global share it'll have to be 50 billion dollars uh which is you know almost a 48% uh you know compounded annual growth rate every year so that's the kind of uh, potential that the space sector has and that's the kind of uh, responsibility that the government has through these three agencies to grow the space sector at that rate now obviously the government cannot do it alone uh, the government can be a facilitator uh but the government cannot uh, by itself ensure that the space sector grows uh, at that pace in india if we are really to uh, you know achieve our targets so what are these agencies doing uh, these agencies are tapping into the indian uh, it potential that you know uh, we all know that india is a great uh, you know technology uh, you know uh, 
power in the sense that we have a lot of human resources which are working in the technology field uh, you know uh, about uh, 4.36 million engineers uh, existing in india right now and uh, a lot of uh, you know new research around especially the downstream part of the space uh, sector applications taking place in india now you have a number of indian space uh, startups uh, which are coming up but i'll talk a little bit more about that later right now uh, suffice it to say that india has the right vision it has the right uh, strategy uh, in terms of uh, promoting the private sector there are a number of policies that the indian government is also coming up with with all which i'll touch upon and india has the right sort of capacity right now with the startups uh, with uh, you know the government agencies with public sector agencies and with you know uh, coordinating agencies which are like the ecosystem engineers so the ground is set in india now it's time for action and what we are going to be seeing more of from 2021 uh, you know uh, up till 2024 and even uh, 2030 is a lot of lot of accelerated effort in developing india's space economy and space infrastructure so i'll stop there uh, shelly back to you Well, thank you, Arpit. That is amazing and fascinating how quickly India is going to grow and the exponential compounded growth rate you highlighted. Rushanka, would you please share some of your insights on what you're seeing as the emerging trends in India? Sure, Shelly. Thank you so much for giving me this opportunity. Hello, all. It's a great honor to be speaking alongside experts from these different space sectors today on this amazing platform provided by Space Foundation. Special thanks to Shelly for having me today to participate in this dialogue for emerging markets in India. Indian economy is based on agriculture predominantly and it serves as the major portion for which it is for which is more than 50% we can say. The more sectors like education, healthcare, transportation, trade, manufacturing, construction, along with other sectors like space. I can say other sector as a space because it is not the predominant in India and many of the people are still not aware of the space benefits. This comprises remaining half portion of the economy are, and that are in the developing phase. Talking about Indian space ventures, then India's space programs, as well said by Arpit, it took off in 1960s to be very precise it was in 1969 and in very few decades the india indian space services have taken a giant leap thus attracting foreign investors to collaborate with indian space programs making it an emerging market for the space ecosystem india showcased 2% global space industrial economy in 2019-20 and aiming to increase up to at least 15% until 2024 which is really a huge leap indian space research organization has now joined hands with non government private entities like startups industries and academic institutions this resulted in the trajectory of space exploration growing and has been reaching new job breaking avenues india is one of the emerging markets in the space sector contributing to the growth of space resources availability to the human mankind academic research around space studies has been practiced in india since a very long time and it can be found in mythological literatures too it is very evident the ideas got wings to them with the upliftment and awareness of the stem sector that is the emerging science technology engineering and mathematics studies which is we call it uh, modern studies collaborative initiatives of indian space research organization along with startups industries and these academic institutions have led to achieve tremendous milestones in reaching for stars india is really doing good may not be best towards development of space economy though but it's really doing good in less than like four decades i can say india has done a lot of progress in space sector and it is also very well uh, well fledged for upstream processing which is also explained by arpit earlierly that is launching of rockets and putting the satellites into orbit it is well done a very great job done by indian space research organization along with the partnerships that they have done with private sectors now awareness of downstream applications for space applications is the one in need to be worked upon 
the applications which use remote sensing data and navigation like satellites for agriculture, sa uh, settlements, forestry, watershed, climate studies, navigation and communication. It is still inadequate in India. That's what India needs to work. And after all, space is for all and it connects all of us. Well, thank you, Roshanka. I completely agree with you at Space Foundation. We believe that there's a place for everyone in the new global space ecosystem. And both you and ARPED have highlighted some great opportunities uh, in India. Dana, we'd love to hear your thoughts and insight about what you're seeing in the emerging trends in India as well. Definitely. Thank you, Shelley. And I want to thank you. I'm, I'm just back from Huntsville, Rocket City. Um, and I just want to commend you for your leadership in igniting uh, this generation's passion for space and bringing us all together here. Um, I think uh, Arpit and Roshanka have hit on some key, uh, you know, drivers from the various sides of the Indian space sector. I'm going to talk about the partnership from the U.S. and more global side um, and how to uh, how to do more cooperation there. And I'll just disclaimer my whole set of comments to say that. These are my own comments. I'm not representing the comments of the US government or LILT or Summit Group or any prior or current employer. Um, I'm really bringing together you know, my knowledge uh, and what I'm seeing as a trend. So with that, I'll jump right in. <laughs> um, so I think it's important to start out when you're looking at trends that you know, India is the ninth largest trading partner of the US with over 150 billion in trade. And I've really watched this uh, Biden administration in the last few months really kick off um, and reignite some, some key economic and scientific pillars of the relationship. Um, you know, Rishanka talked about the applications of, of space toward climate and, and uh, agriculture and key sectors. And we're very much seeing that play out in the discussions between the U.S. and Indian governments. Um, I think one of the trends is a whole lot of interest in, you know, how American and, and European and, 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 and countries that are part of the what I would call the, the, the global good actors who want to work for, uh, for the right things together in this, in this partnership, civilian and otherwise, a lot, of, a lot of activity there. I think people have realized that there's a lot going on in India, very high value that they want to partner with and, and cooperate with. Um, one of the trends though that I'm seeing is that a lot of US companies are still struggling with some uh, Indian um, public sector structures that I know ARPIT is saying they're, they're all under revision and they're being worked on and developed, but there's still some legal and regulatory things with the way that uh, foreign companies are treated within India that still needs some work for, you know, for U.S. and, and other uh, countries, companies to feel like they can really go in and, and do business, uh, you know, in a competitive way uh, and, and succeed there. So there's, there's still some, some business legal framework that needs to be worked on. One of the other areas that I'm seeing is the areas around localization and partnership. So it's no secret that, you know, there's a lot of interest in from the Indian government and in having foreign companies set up entities within India and cooperate there, either under joint venture or setting up some kind of entity within India, which I think a lot of companies want to do. Um, again, localization is a huge is a huge factor. And I think it gets lost in all of the, the STEM talk that we do around, you know, propulsion and remote sensing and all of the things that we need for space. But there's a whole infrastructure around that that needs to support all of that work. And I think I, I would urge uh, companies to look at that supportive infrastructure around um, those competencies. Um, we're also seeing a lot of AI uh, and machine learning technology going into this so that, you know, that as things and projects are developing and technologies are developing, it can rapidly learn and rapidly impart that learning back into, um, into the ecosystem. So, uh, so these are the, some of the trends that, uh, that I'm seeing. I would just urge that uh, a couple of tips 
unless we're going to get to it later, I wanted to talk about some advocacy, but maybe Shelley, that's better parked in the later part of the conversation. Well, thank you, Dana. I'll be happy to follow up with an advocacy question as well. But before uh, you leave us, Dana, I did want to ask, you talked about some of the areas where we could look to support investment in India. What are some of those export opportunities you're seeing? And I'll start with you, Dana, and then we'll circle back to Arpit and Rushanka on that question. I mean, there are a lot of dual use. There's a lot of interest in dual use technologies, particularly around space and defense. And those are the issues that are, I think, very lucrative uh, two ways, <laughs> both ways to, to those that are partnering. Um, but there are also some of the areas that are harder to, um, you know, harder to come to grips with in terms of the U.S. side and exportability, um, security and technology security, um, but also including in, in uh, Roshanka's area of remote sensing and some other technologies, optical technologies. Um, so there's a huge interest for optical and, and sensing technologies, but I think the infrastructure still and regulatory cooperation needs to be fixed around that. I don't know if that answered the question as you desired, but I think that the defense and dual use is the area where there's a lot of high, high financial potential and then where there could be some downstream application on the civilian side. Excellent. And I agree. The dual use is a, is a great methodology. It's used here in the U.S. Um, greatly as we look at how can we use things both for government use as well as a commercialization methodology. Arpit, uh, did you have any comments or thoughts about that uh, exportability and what those opportunities might be or the dual use uh, concept? I'd like to I'd like to speak a little bit about the opportunities that we have on the downstream uh, bit of space application. So, you no, know, uh, there has been a recent report by Morgan Stanley, and you know, uh, a lot of uh, those conversations have come up uh, even in uh, some parliamentary discussions. That uh, if we look at the future uh, growth that uh, India and most of the developing countries are going to see, uh, we're going to see that about fifty percent of the projected growth in the telecom sector, especially is going to be uh, powered by space industry and uh, you know uh, fast forward to 20 30 years down the line it's probably even going to the bullish figure is about 70 percent so uh, now if you look at india it is uh, at that unique opportunity where the telecom sector is uh, developed uh, to just the right level so you know uh, it's not developed to a level where it is oversaturated it is not developed to a level where, uh, you know, uh, there's no growth, which is uh, possible in a, you know, radical, meaningful way. But it is not so underdeveloped that, uh, you know, uh, you don't have the right infrastructure, you don't have the right, you know, uh, uh, fertile ground to, uh, you know, plant the seeds for radical development. And I think that, you know, uh, with, uh, you know, a number of regulations which are uh, on the cards for the Indian telecom sector, uh it has already been liberalized you know uh, twice in the past by a number of governments uh but there is more and more liberalization to come in the telecom sector in india uh and there i believe uh, there is a lot of scope for just a change of the market models where you know uh, currently the telecom sector uh it, it is almost a duopoly in India at it, as it has uh, developed in many other countries. But then uh, the Indian telecom sector has kind of seen those crests and troughs where it becomes a duopoly and then, you know, uh, a number of free market interventions are there and new players come and new players emerge. So with those things happening uh, and with new technologies coming in, I think uh, that there is a great, great, great opportunity over there. I absolutely agree with Dana, uh, Dana on the, uh, you know, uh, defense applications, because uh, that's certainly, you know, uh, if you bring in the national security aspect over there, uh, you'd see that India is in a greater, uh, you know, military cooperation uh, through uh, with the United States, with Australia and Japan through the Quad security grouping. And, uh, you know, uh, recently, uh, you, uh, United uh, States Secretary of State, uh, Secretary Antony Blinken visited India and there was a lot of uh, positive, a lot of great conversation with uh, our foreign minister, uh, Minister Jay Shankar on uh, cooperation on technology, cooperation on uh, you know, uh, technology, especially in the face of defense. 
Uh, and I think that the way that uh, India is uh, playing a role in the great power competition, uh, you know, providing a counterbalance to, uh, you know, uh, in, in the immediate geography, China, uh, along with other uh, security partners, uh, that is going to, uh, you know, uh, push India towards greater and greater, uh, you know, uh, investment and development towards its defense tech capabilities. Right now, a lot of Indian defense is still, uh, you know, uh, based on, you know, the human power that you have on the ground. And there's been a lot of conversation on, you know, uh, how do you uh, rationalize that a little? How do you bring in more technology? Uh, there's a lot of uh, things to unpack over there on the defense front, but then uh, I, I'd be happy to come back to it again. Yeah. Excellent. Thank you, Arpit. Rushanka, I saw you nodding your head a few times and I wanted to get your thoughts on that those export opportunities as well as, you know, do you see more of a dual use capability uh, for India and its space technology going forward? I definitely agree with this because we already are using space technology in our, in our whole daily life. Like in a whole day, we use mobiles, we use Google Maps. We are doing a number of things using space technology, but we are not aware of it. And even... Everybody in a house is having a mobile uh, nowadays. Everybody, even kids have mobiles because nowadays, because of pandemic, the schools are online and every child is given a mobile or a tablet in his hand and they're using space technology, but they are not aware that they are using space technology. <laughs> so I definitely agree with the, uh, uh, the uh, conversation and discussion uh, which we had before. And uh, I, I, I really look forward that uh, people should be aware about uh, applications of space technology, especially the remote sensing applications, because uh, India is agriculture based, uh, you know, a country. And even then, you know, people are not having enough food for their uh, a whole day. I mean, they, they can't afford one time meal. There are people who don't who don't have one time meal even. Even though we are agriculture based, uh, you know, uh, country and we have agriculture based economy. So using space technology, if we can, if we can change this scenario, then it will be definitely the most amazing thing in this world that can happen. So I really look forward uh, to the applications of uh, remote sensing, especially for climate and agriculture, along with everything like natural resource management, which can actually make our lives better at least on this earth to survive. <laughs> Space tourism is already there, but still to survive on earth, we really need to take the opportunities and all the resources which are provided by space technology in our day-to-day -day -day life and make proper usage of them to have a better life for everyone. Absolutely. And I think, Rushanka, you highlighted when individuals use precision agriculture, which is using GPS to help with agriculture, right. your yields increase by 10%. Right. And again, as we look at a, you know, a growing population and the need to uh, grow more food and create more uh, resources for growing food, we have to look at different methodologies than we're using. And space technology and precision agriculture can be one of those solutions. So thank you, Rushanka. That was a great insight. Now what I'd like to do is share that there are several organizations that have called year, the year 2021 the year of the woman. One of them is ICESCO. Another group is the World Space Week organization. So what I'd like to do is kind of combine the year of the woman with entrepreneurship and what's taking place in India. So Rashanka, let's start with you. What are some of the emerging trends for female entrepreneurs in India? And I do want to hear about all entrepreneurs, but let's highlight the female entrepreneurs initially. What are some of your insights? Well, I think although the state of space ecosystem seems very promisingly, sadly, the role of uh, the woman in space is underrepresented in India. The hurdles lies in girls getting basic STEM education. It is really, uh, really very sad part, but that's the truth. Because even in the top Indian institutes, I was an Indian Institute of Technology, but even then in those institutes, we could see only 10% of girls and all, uh, all the, you know, the whole campus was filled with 90% of male. So it's, it's really under representation of uh, women in uh, STEM sectors and which unfortunately uh, reflects into the uh, real world scenario in corporate sector in different uh, stem sectors especially 
uh, we already know that the first woman of uh, Indian origin to go to space was Kalpana Chawla, and uh, who was an astronaut uh, and an engineer for NASA. Uh, I'm very fortunate to receive a scholarship awarded in memory of uh, of her to attend the International Space uh, Studies Program in 2019. This program involved participation of candidates from over 30 countries and was international, intercultural, and interdisciplinary. Shelly must be knowing that very nicely. <laughs> Thus forming an alliance to boost the space collaborative environment globally. The participants were from all the realms of space sector, including medicine, economics, law, management, science, technology, psychology even, etc. The brilliant part was it comprised of 50% women forming gender balance. This was the highlight of that program, along with all other, you know, um, um, great uh, and amazing opportunities that uh, it provided to us. I'm currently on the uh, advisory team of Kalpana Chawla Scholarship Program to promote and advocate uh, the women in space uh, contribution towards India and global space economics uh, uh, ecosystem. I feel upliftment of women, despite all the hurdles they face in personal and professional life, would definitely help strengthen the Indian space ecosystem. And um, entrepreneurism is like, you know, it gives you a freedom to talk. It gives you a freedom to work. It gives you a freedom to work on your own at any time. And it's similar to having, uh, having you know, uh, a freedom uh, towards a research when you do uh, during your PhD or something, because you work for 24 hours, but it gives, it still gives you freedom and it gives you accomplishment. So uh, with this, I think uh, um, uh, the, uh, the startups and the corporate sectors, they should give uh, the opportunities to the women uh, who actually uh, can tackle problems, of course, they can manage, but the trust should be there and the people who can support them should be there. So uh, either they can be male or female, that doesn't matter. Support is required from uh, any gender, any age. So the mentality is the most important thing here. Anybody can do anything. It doesn't matter. Wonderful. I love that, Roshanka. Well, Arpit, I real I know that you have the GPODS Fellowship Program and, and you're in partnership with Space Foundation on some research projects. I'd like to hear your thoughts about entrepreneurship in India and especially your thoughts about female entrepreneurs in India as well. Certainly, certainly, Shelley. So uh, first of all, I think uh, what Roshanka said over here makes a lot of sense. Uh, I believe that the potential for uh, female entrepreneurs in India and entrepreneurship generally in India is uh, still unrealized and underutilized because, uh, you know, uh, half of our population certainly is, uh, uh, you know, uh, female and half of our entrepreneurship, uh, you know, uh, human capabilities should uh, come from the females of India. However, unfortunately, uh, currently, the way that you see the whole structure is, uh, you know, the the number of entrepreneurs in India uh, are dominated by uh, the male players in the market. And uh, that really gets you to think a lot about uh, how our education system and how our social systems are structured. Because when you're talking about female entrepreneurship, Entrepreneurship obviously comes with a lot of risk taking. It comes with, uh, you know, not not having, uh, you know, the ro uh, the right side of role models and, uh, you know, having the right amount of uh, support from your community, from your family and your friends. And just the amount of uh, risk that uh, men can take in India, even today, uh, it far surpasses the uh, sort of risk that females can uh, you know uh, take in the Indian social structure, especially when we're talking about the middle class in India, uh, the middle and the lower middle classes in India, because the problem over here is that there are competing pressures on females to uh, you know uh, get married at the right age, or uh, you know uh, there's there's this whole notion of uh, you know in India even today most of the entrepreneurs would have uh, you know the seed funding coming in from family and friends. And then uh, since uh, India is still a patriarchal society, if you're, uh, you know, a married woman and if you're taking, uh, you know, uh, money from your uh, husband or from your in-laws family, then in a way it's considered as if you owe it to them. Uh, and 
you know those those become challenges uh, because if if i'm a guy and if i want money uh, you know from me or from my wife's family yes indeed i would think that i owe it to them certainly but then uh, the thing is that there'll still be a little bit of risk tolerance on their part uh, which unfortunately doesn't exist for females in india uh, now when we talk about the education system uh, indeed india has achieved a lot in terms of educating its women but then still if you look at the numbers you'd see that the dropout rates for women uh, is way higher in india uh, when the dropout rate is way higher uh, you can also imagine that uh, in higher education there are fewer women who are joining especially fewer women in stem programs now uh, what do we do about it we have to uh, you know open out spaces which are more innovative which can get more women in and which can uh, get more women uh, mentors and role models uh, in so that you know women start thinking in that direction typically you know uh, there's a lot of research which says that you cannot uh, think about a number of jobs uh, you know for example you know uh, in mexico there has been research even in india there has been research that you know uh, women especially in the middle classes would only think about gendered jobs uh, if you ask them as children that okay what do you want to be uh, when you grow up uh, i have said this before uh, you know in another panel with shelly and i'm going to say this again that i think that uh, just the singular example of kalpana chavla uh, has done a lot 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 more than the uh, you know many efforts from the education system side or many educate uh, you know uh, many of these efforts from social evangelists that uh, has spurred a lot of uh, women to uh, join the space uh, you know space industry and in india now you can go to schools and you can talk to uh, you know uh, women and uh, children and they would tell you that they want to become an astronaut when they grow up or they want to uh, you know work in isro when they grow up these things were absolutely non existent earlier now at gpods uh, what we have done so gpods is the global policy diplomacy and sustainability fellowship that uh, wherein shelly uh, is also a mentor and dana is going to be coming in as a mentor uh, what we have done over there is to first bring in role models uh, who are working in you know uh, industries that are typically uh, you know if you are coming from a middle or lower middle class background in india that would not be the first uh, you know and if you are a woman that would, that may not be the first thing that will be on the top of your career choices because uh, a lot of times uh, you know uh, women uh, in in those uh, you know uh, areas or uh, you know in those uh, you know uh, socio economic segments haven't seen the right role models uh, and what we are doing over here is uh, bringing women politicians bringing women entrepreneurs uh, bringing uh, you know women diplomats uh, and you know both uh, political diplomats and uh, you know economic diplomats like dana so that women can have the right role models and they can develop into professionals that can grow in the space industry so i'll just stop there and then uh, hand it over back to shelly Well thank you so much and and we at Space Foundation believe in that as well it's important to have mentors and coaches and champions and creating role models and so I'm honored to be a mentor for Gpods as well So I'm going to give the last question to Dana cuz she started it in her opening comments about the importance of advocacy and awareness. And Dana, I'd like to give you the opportunity to close out our session today with your thoughts about the importance of advocacy and awareness in the growing glo- global space ecosystem and especially in India. Great. Thank you, Shelly. Well, I'll just say that as we started this conversation, we talked about all of the sort of governmental and economic activity that there's this huge political drive to do more in this space and to cooperate in a huge opportunity um in the dual use and civilian use frankly but i want to make our audience aware that there are a number of very free and available resources to them where they can link this political support to their entrepreneurship or their company's desire to to partner uh if we're coming from the US to India or from India into the US and partner on space. So I would just start with saying the US commercial uh, US Commerce Department and the US Commercial Service is a great place for all parties to start. So if you're from India and you're looking to partner with US companies and develop 
uh, technology or, you know, or, or looking to partner on this side of the pond, that commercial service at the U.S. Uh, embassy in India, in, in New Delhi and spread around our consulates, they can help you link up that foreign direct investment desire and par help partner you into the right spaces here in America. And similarly, for American companies, even if you're an entrepreneur of one, like I've been twice in my career, um, or whether you're a company of 100,000, you can still qualify for US commercial advocacy um, through the Commerce Department here. Um, they have a whole team called the Advocacy Center. You can get all that information online. They're very responsive. And um, they can help you um, promote you and your business and your activity into the US. There are all kinds of trade associations, uh, two-way bilateral business resources that are there. Uh, and, um, and I think that that would be a, the best place to start because they don't cost you anything and, um, and they can link you in with the right partnerships. Well, thank you for that. And I want to thank you, Arpit, Dana, and Rushanka. We're grateful for your time. Uh, the time has gone so quickly. So this is just the tip of the iceberg. But we hope that you'll come back and join us on a future discussion. And we'll be able to continue the dialogue about emerging trends in India. Thank you, Shelley. So to our audience today, if you're interested in learning more about our Space Foundation programs or watching other international emerging trend webinars, go to spacefoundation.org and check out our emerging trends series. Thank you, and we look forward to seeing you again. There's a place for everyone in the new global space ecosystem.